My name is Nadine Crone. I'm joining you today from the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Clayton today. I am a general surgeon. I am a researcher. I am a professor at UBC. I am a mother. I love to be in the outdoors, and I like to take all of my passions and put them together to a career and a lifestyle that I love and enjoy. I was first introduced to STEM, I think, just like every other kid um, in elementary school and then in high school. But in high school at Westside Secondary in Kamloops, which is where I grew up, I had some great teachers uh, in the sciences and they showed that it could be interesting, it could be fun, that uh, it was um, something that you could work to understand. And it had all of those kind of aha moments when I would struggle over a concept and then something would finally make sense. Uh, and it was one of those areas where I found that you didn't have to memorize things if you took the time in to understand. And then once you understood, you could apply to a whole bunch of different areas. And then when I left high school, I went to Simon Fraser University where I went into kinesiology. And kinesiology was a study basically of the human body and, and how it works, the physiology, the anatomy, the passive physiology. And that was fascinating. And it really did apply much of what I had learned uh, in the STEM uh, subjects that I studied in high school, but put it into a context that I could really understand as an athlete. So I played basketball at Simon Fraser University and I studied kinesiology and uh, that was a great mix uh, to understand when things happened and how things happen on a basketball court or for athletes on a track or in other sports, how you could actually really boil it down to the understanding of the science behind it all. Uh, I loved it. And it was that mixture of science and the human body that really set things up nicely for me to go into medicine. It was the perfect uh, career for me um, to not only understand it, but then to use that understanding and that passion to help other people as you try to figure out what was wrong and what you could do to be part of the solution to fix those symptoms or that condition. Every time I went into something, whether it was kinesiology at Simon Fraser University or medicine at the University of British Columbia, or I even, you know, I did public health um, down at Harvard or surgical endocrinology down at UCSF or University of California, San Francisco. All of those things, what amazed me is that I thought I, I knew what I was signing up to study and it really opened more doors. If opportunities are this big mansion, you kind of walk down a hallway, you pick a door, you walk through it and you're gonna study that room, you're gonna be in that room. And then I realized that uh, it actually just opened more and more opportunities and more and more choices. And that was surprising to me and it remains surprising to me, which is why when I say, you know, I signed up to be a general surgeon and then I became a general and endocrine surgeon. And then I started doing research. Uh, I really started expanding my career into public health. I started the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health with some amazing colleagues at UBC. Um, really started to understand the context of our healthcare system for rural, remote, northern, and indigenous Canadians. So all of that was amazing. I think to boil it down is the more you go into things with your eyes wide open, the more you're going to uh, get out of it and the more opportunities that are going to come to you. I think the most rewarding aspect really in terms of if I were to look at the people that I meet, uh, whether it's as a physician, surgeon, researcher, teacher, it would be hearing their stories. It's an amazing honor to be a physician where one of the things you first do when you're trying to figure out what happened or what's wrong or what could be the diagnosis is you ask questions. You ask questions about where they were, who they are, and then they, they share these amazing personal stories with you uh, and the amount of trust that they put in you to do that never ceases to amaze me. And I hope I never lose the gratitude that I have for them to be uh, so giving and so trusting when I, I've just met them or I don't know them for very long. I think anyone in medicine is really teaching it. Because for example, if as a surgeon, I see a patient and let's say they have a mass in their thyroid gland 
and I talk to them, they share their story. I have my suspicions about what the diagnosis might be. Maybe I order some additional tests and ultimately let's say that it comes back and it's thyroid cancer. Then I recommend to them uh, an operation and I have to share with them what's the operation, what does it mean, what are the potential risks, what are the potential complications, what are the potential benefits of doing the surgery, what are their other options, and in the end you have to get all of this information conveyed so that they can make a choice. Do they want the operation or not? And you want that choice to be an informed decision. And so even though that patient is not someone that you're there to teach, you can't help but be a teacher in terms of explaining all of this so that they can make an informed decision. What we think about the standard teaching in medical school, I also love, which is teaching medical students, residents, fellows. That's the standard teaching. And I love that because uh, it's very challenging. It reminds me because I was at one point a medical student, at one point I was a resident, and I was a fellow at one point. So it reminds me of the path that I've taken. Um, but it also reminds me of the enthusiasm and the curiosity and the excitement uh, that I felt at those stages. Because, you know, third year medical students, second year medical students, or first year surgery residents, they're excited about things that I forget sometimes are exciting. Um, because I do them every day. And so it's nice to be reminded that what you do is fun, it's exciting, it's inspiring, it's challenging. Uh, and I think the, having the ability to teach uh, students and trainees along that spectrum reminds me of that. I don't think I can walk you through a day in the life. It's, it's such a diverse career path that I've chosen and or that has been given to me over the years. There's some things that are definitely always consistent. I think one of the things is being a mom. And so always checking in and finding out what's going on in my daughter's day is one of my favorite parts of the day. But when it comes to like the, the career, the teaching or research, it depends. Uh, yesterday I had an OR day. So it was an early morning, uh, wanting to get there on time, uh, getting to the hospital and seeing my patient and reviewing their radiology images and heading to the OR to talk to the OR team, the nurses, the anesthesiologist, and then uh, having the day in the operating room. In between calling patients, calling colleagues, doing some work on my laptop before the next case, and then coming back home and uh, have a research grant due. So I was working on that last night after I got home from taking my daughter out cross-country skiing. Today, I followed up with my patients that had their OR yesterday, and they're doing great, which was always wonderful to hear. And then I had some meetings for either the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health or the First Nations Health Authority Chair in Cancer and Wellness at UBC. So a lot of research meetings this morning with colleagues and students and trainees and working on the darn grant again. Uh, and then this afternoon, I have some more clinical work where I'm meeting up with patients and uh, connecting with my office staff. Tomorrow, uh, I'm going to be pretty busy because next week at UBC, we have a week-long course on COVID in Indigenous populations. And so I'm going to be really trying to make sure that all of the work is done and ready as we have a full week-long course. So you can see it's a combination of things. No day is the same. And I actually love that. Uh, it keeps things interesting. It keeps me on my toes. And it's a career path that works for me. You know, there's only 24 hours in a day, only seven days in a week, and it doesn't matter who you are. Everybody's equal that way. I'm busy. But I think I'm working harder and harder on, on managing that and finding time to get out and, and do things that I love and enjoy. But I think I've always done that. Um, sports has been an outlet for me. It's been a way that I've used to deal with stress. And sometimes I say I go out for runs in the trails to when I need to think. And I go out for runs in the trails when I want to do anything but think. Uh, I can use it both ways. Um, and then when the snow comes up in northern British Columbia, then I cross-country ski. And then in the summer, uh, my husband and I paddle, which uh, I've just started recently picking up and I love. But I love reading. I love sitting in front of the fireplace with a good coffee. 
And I love doing just about anything with my daughter, whether it's sports or hanging out or um, just sitting and talking and finding out about how she views the world and the things that are happening. I love it. And um, I certainly always can find time for that. The TED Talk that I did was really there to hopefully make people think about all those stories we hear in the media, stories that we hear in the news or see in the newspapers or on social media about the first this or the first that. And to ensure that we always take a look and, and wonder what in that story is the good news? What should we celebrate? The accomplishments of an individual. And what in that story needs to be addressed? Why this year is it the first? And sometimes, you know, that's okay. You know, um, when it comes to massive accomplishments, whether they're in sports or science or otherwise, sometimes it's the first because it just takes that many years to do something like that. The Canadian Space Agency or in track and field. Um, but sometimes when it's in this case, a lot of the news we hear about in terms of the first First Nations person to do this or the first Indigenous person to do that. I think we have to stop and wonder why in 2022 or 2021, or, um, is it the first? Are we covering up faults and gaps and chasms in society when all we focus on is the accomplishment of an individual rather than the pitfalls and the downsides of how society has moved forward as a whole. I've really strived to figure out how I can play a role in addressing that. Because as the first, I think, recognizing you're also the only. And you need to be part of figuring out how to change the only into a few, and the few into the many, and the many into the often. And when it comes to STEM uh, and medicine, I think there's a lot of work uh, that needs to be done when it comes to Indigenous students and uh, that representation for communities. And we're working on that. I think the main thing is working at elementary and high school levels uh, and in communities to make learning opportunities available, but to also make them fun, to make them encouraging, to inspire kids and make sure that the messages they get are that these are all doors that are ready for them. All they have to do is open them and step in. I think the other thing is, is making sure that when they do that, that the post-secondary institutions are responsible for making sure that that's a place that they can go. Not only that they can go, but they want to go and that it's welcoming and it's culturally safe and it's relevant and there's opportunities. And then when they are there, you support them and it's a safe environment. It's a comforting environment. It's supportive environment. And then when they graduate from these post-secondary degrees, they have the opportunity. They can head out and use their new wings and fly and get their jobs and go back to their communities or go back to their, their next goal in life. Or they can stay and do a, an advanced degree, a master's, a PhD. After medical school, it's residency and, and fellowships. Any individual, they set their goals on what they would love to achieve. Whether they succeed or not is really up to them. And the systems and the society that they work within are there to support them, not to beat them down or put up barricades. And I don't think we're there yet, but I think it's better than it used to be. My hope is that youth start to realize that their future is really so open and there for them to grasp. I know that they sometimes get messages otherwise. They may hear negative messages. They may hear that things aren't possible. They may hear that things aren't there for them. And those are hard messages to ignore. I think my theory is it takes 100 positive messages to overcome one negative message. And I think we need to, as society, as education systems, to really try to ship things so that the students hear those positive messages. And there are supports there for them, whether it's support education-wise uh, for teaching, whether it's support in the system so they have more opportunity to have the full spectrum of STEM subjects in their high schools to learn, whether it's financial support, so when they have dreams and aspirations, they can actually access those and get to post-secondary education institutions. 
and somehow that we can create a, a space for these students that when they're on social media, when they're in the classroom, when they're talking to their parents, when they're talking to community members, when they look for role models, they can see enough positive out there to know that they can be part of that story. And I think part of it is too, is for those who succeed and become part of that story and reach their dreams and become who they want to be, that they turn around and they help the people behind them, the youth that are seeing them do that and want to be like them, to turn around and lend that virtual hand to say that they were once in their spot too and they did it so the person behind them should be able to follow in their footsteps. If someone's interested in medicine, there's such a role for mentors, someone that they can go to to share their interests, to share their ideas about what they might do, to share their dreams, uh, and to have that mentor uh, work with them in their specific situation, from the community they're in, to the dreams that they have, to the schools or universities they want to get to, and uh, be able to really work uh, with that individual to help them reach their goal. I think that's really, really critical. Just being a detective to find out who's out there that's done what you want to do and consider reaching out to them or to the organization they work with. There's also the role of actually getting summer jobs in these areas where you're working in STEM. That's part of the giving back. It's giving back, becoming that role model, but at the same time, immersing yourself in environments where people are supportive uh, and will help you get to your next your, your next rung on the ladder, so to speak, in terms of your career pathway. I think a big task that we're undertaking right now in BC, but hopefully across Canada, is addressing cultural safety uh, in the healthcare system. I think we focus a lot on access to healthcare, and we don't focus so much on utilization of healthcare. And sometimes just because a building exists, and there's healthcare providers within that building and the resources. If it's not a culturally safe place to be, if it's not free of discrimination, negative stereotypes, bias, racism, it's gonna be a place that individuals do not feel comfortable going to. And so I think that's something that we can and we should and we must address. And there's lots of work that we're doing on that right now uh, at UBC, at the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, and in the healthcare profession. Other things with respect to the healthcare system is really striving for that equity. I call it the elusive chase for equity because I think as Canadians, it's a, it's a concept that we think that we have. We look at our Canada Health Act and we say that we have this universal healthcare system, but you don't have to work too long in the healthcare system to realize that it's not universal. It's not fair. It's not justly distributed. It's inequitable. But I think there's steps we can make to improve that. And I think underlying it all, it is a system in Canada. And I think we have the principles as a country to actually move the healthcare systems that we have, province by province, territory by territory, and those specifically for Indigenous peoples, uh, into a place that's equitable, fair, just, safe, successful, where an individual, when they walk through the doors of a health clinic, may be scared of the feelings like in terms of symptoms or what happened, but in the back of their mind, they know that they're going to a place that will help. And if that's an underlying feeling of a Canadian or anybody walking through the doors of a Canadian healthcare institution, I think that would be an amazing, amazing accomplishment. Mm -hmm.